Welcome to the afternoon session. Uh, I hope um, we've dispelled the notion that there's no such thing as a free lunch. That was pretty good. Did you guys like lunch? All right, I, I thought that was good. And um, you're in California. I did want to point out that the vegetables were raised in a cage-free environment. Um, I'm Jeff Margolis, and it's my honor to facilitate the keynote session of our conference today. Uh, although I'm sure everybody here would acknowledge that um, all of this morning's speakers are keynote worthy, uh, except for the ones that said things I didn't agree with. <laughs> um, I've been involved in the healthcare forecast conference uh, for many years. Um, I remember the early days of this conference when Paul Feldstein was advocating for the legalization of color television. <laughs> um, when, when phones were analog and actually worked, um, when the best and brightest uh, high school and college students wanted to serve in the government um, and could credibly withstand the interrogatory and witticism of figures such as our keynote speaker this afternoon. Um, you know, on a, as I approach 30 years in the healthcare industry, uh, despite my youthful appearance, <laughs> Um, I can't remember a time when the, the word crisis wasn't part of our collective description, um, where the disconnection between academic understanding uh, and consumer experience was not vast, uh, where private health plans, public health officials and provider organizations didn't face a tower of Babel, uh, where vocabulary and meaning were basically in mixed company incomprehensible hard to carry on a conversation. And so it's a, it's a rare treat for all of us when we get to see a bright light that can cut through this fog in our industry. And when many give in to despair, um, a rational response, by the way, to our industry challenges, uh, it's, it's, it's wonderful to hear from someone who can lend insightful humor uh, to help us understand that we might find a way uh, out of healthcare's perpetual doom cycle uh, by understanding what causes and creates the environment we're in. So of course the luminary I have the pleasure to introduce today is Norm Ornstein, Dr. Ornstein, but we'll call him Mr. Ornstein per his preference, um, is a longtime observer of Congress and politics. He writes a weekly column for the National Journal and the Atlantic called Washington Inside Out. So he's been inside the new normal for a long time. <laughs> he's a TV personality, um, was an election eve analyst for CBS News um, for many years and recently principal on-air election analyst for the BBC. Uh, he serves as a co-director of the AEI Brookings Election Reform Project. He's a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences elected in 2004. Um, he's written a number of books, um, but uh, the most recent book that I think everyone should get a chance to read here is uh, the New York Times bestseller, It's Even Worse Than It Looks. <laughs> How the American constitutional system collided with the new politics of extremism, where we saw on the slide this morning. That was named Book of the Year by Wonk Blog, by the way. Um, and uh, he's regarded as one of the top global thinkers in our space. One of the things I really enjoy about uh, Norm is his Midwestern work ethic. He went to the University of Minnesota and the University of Michigan. He has a number of degrees and he won the um, Above Average Award. Um, <laughs> named for its first recipient, uh, Garrison Keillor. I can just tell you from knowing Norm, <laughs> <laughs> I can just tell you that, that Norm is, um, is, is way above average. Um, he, he's a special person. Um, you are really in for a treat, and so please join me in giving a rousing welcome to Norm Ornstein. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, unfortunately, being above average in an era of great inflation is <laughs> a bit limited. 
So this is, um, if I'm right, Margaret, my 17th year uh, at this conference, and I was thinking I've been bathed in nostalgia going back. Uh, it was uh, 1997 was the first year. Uh, Newt Gingrich was Speaker of the House, uh, and I was actually thinking about uh, one of my really bad predictions uh, back in 2012. When Mitt Romney won the nomination, I said I thought that Newt would be his running mate because I thought it was a perfectly balanced ticket, a Mormon and a polygamist. And, <laughs> and I was wrong. Uh, and of course, it was also the era of the Bush-Cheney administration, and the Cheneys have been back in the news uh, recently. Liz Cheney was running for the Senate in uh, Wyoming and then uh, decided to uh, pull out. And I thought, uh, at last, we have a Cheney with an exit strategy. Uh, so. <laughs> Uh, now, I do want to uh, start with, uh, mm -hmm. if uh, Dean is, uh, is here, um, Dean is always, as he said, looking for the movies and the analogies, and he couldn't really easily find one this time. And I actually had thought that you have to look to the TV side, um, and for me, it was Breaking Bad. And if you remember, Breaking Bad was a series about a chemist uh, who gets cancer, can't pay his medical bills, and opens up a meth lab. Uh, or as some have called it, the Republican alternative to Obamacare. <laughs> so. At least until recently, Joe. Now, now, now there is an alternative. Uh, so um, this morning, by the way, uh, in a heartbreaking uh, overtime uh, loss, the women's hockey team uh, lost the gold medal, uh, blowing a 2-0 lead in the last minute to Canada. Uh, and I thought, you know, I could be at the Olympics. Um, I didn't go, partly because I couldn't get a hotel reservation. Uh, the uh, Sheraton Gulag was all filled up. Uh, but also, of course, the security has been just incredible uh, at Sochi, uh, the most intensive in history. The government's monitoring every move, every email, every social media, listening in on every phone call. And that's just the NSA. Uh, you should see what the Russians are doing. So, uh, more news this morning. Chris Christie emerged uh, from his uh, cocoon, uh, as it were, and did a town meeting uh, in New Jersey, which he pledged again, as he did in his State of the State message, that he is going to bring all of the people of New Jersey together. Evidently, it was by having them all try to merge into one lane, but... <laughs> Maybe there's a plan B out there, out there somewhere. So uh, this last year and the beginning of the new one have been very tough for those of us watching politics and for those who are in the arena. Uh, it's been a particularly tough year, of course, for President Obama. Uh, just a few days ago on television, I saw Jimmy Carter comparing him to Jimmy Carter. That's <laughs> tough. New reality series on TV, uh, they're talking about lame duck dynasty. Uh, uh, and uh, this year, the State of the Union, uh, the President gave the ratings were way down. They're now talking about replacing him next year with Amy Poehler and Tina Fey. Uh, it should be very tough. Uh, of course, the President, uh, the, the family, uh, didn't do all that well either. The President has a half-brother who ran for office in Kenya. He ran to be governor of one of the provinces. Donald Trump accused him of being born in the United States. <laughs> Even Michelle uh, had headaches. You remember when she got her hair uh, restyled and she got bangs, uh, uh, and uh, uh, John Boehner uh, demanded further cuts. Uh, so. <laughs> Uh, even a tough year for, uh, for Joe Biden, the Biden family. His niece was arrested on a drunk driving charge. I was thinking, boy, that's got to be tough for the police, convincing a Biden that they have the right to remain silent. It's, <laughs> uh, it's... It was a worse year, of course, for Congress. You saw the numbers uh, that uh, the dean put up. Uh, one low light, uh, Representative Trey Ray Dell uh, arrested uh, on cocaine charges. Uh, he's resigned from office now, but uh, the judge, uh, he pled guilty. The judge sentenced him to four years as mayor of Toronto. Uh, <laughs> uh, 
difficult year for the inaptly named uh, representative, another Floridian, Daniel Webster, who has been trying and met once again with failure to uh, eliminate funding for the annual community survey of the Census Bureau. Uh, now, this will tell you a lot about the contemporary Congress. Uh, of course, the uh, annual community survey is absolutely essential, as every economist and many business people know, to the private and public sectors. It's a way in which businesses determine where to place uh, plants and uh, facilities, uh, police on where to uh, concentrate uh, their forces, where the crime is greatest. Uh, it has a huge impact on the society, but he's been trying to eliminate it, and the reason he said uh, this, uh, Daniel Webster, by the way, is a member of the Science Committee. He said, well, uh, this is not a scientific survey. It's a random survey. <laughs> uh, so. <laughs> member of the Science Committee. You can see why he's not a member of the Intelligence Committee. <laughs> <laughs> And, of course, uh, many of us affected by the government shutdown, uh, which was another uh, of the lowlights of uh, the uh, last year in uh, Congress. We talked about it a little bit in the panel this morning. Uh, it even affected the president. Uh, when the staff came to him and told him that they were going to have to take away his teleprompters, he was speechless. <laughs> so. As always, I like to get you laughing because it's all downhill uh, from, <laughs> from this point uh, on. Um, I, I want to start with just a little bit of a reflection. Uh, I want to talk about the dysfunctional nature of politics and why I think uh, this is the most dysfunctional that I've seen it in what is now, for me, 45 years of being immersed uh, in the old normal, uh, the new normal, and the ongoing abnormal uh, for uh, all of that time. Uh, but the book uh, that Jeff mentioned, it's even worse than it looks, which is out in a, uh, an expanded uh, and up-to-date paperback, and it makes a great holiday gift, uh, by the way. <laughs> Any holiday, you, you pick, pick the holiday. Uh, we passed President's Day, but George Washington's birthday is this weekend, just so you know. Uh, anyhow, I titled it, It's Even Worse Than It Looks, because it never looks good, and it's not supposed to look good. Um, that's the nature of politics in a democracy especially. It's tough to make choices that create tumult in people's lives and make them legitimate for people. Um, so, you know, the old saw that uh, you do not want to watch laws or sausages being made is true. Although, interestingly, uh, a, a political scientist in the Midwest actually went out to a sausage factory and looked at it and said, it's much better than watching, <laughs> much more efficient, as it turns out, than watching the laws being made. Uh, but this is worse, uh, because while it's never supposed to be efficient, we simply have a level of dysfunction that I have not seen before, and it's been building for some period of time. Of course, it's uh, built on the sharp polarization. And I should note that the slide that Dean put up uh, that showed in 2012 uh, that we had shrunk to an overlap of 13 members is now in 2013 down to two. In other words, in the House of Representatives, only two conservative Democrats overlapped with two Republicans uh, who are the most liberal uh, among them. And those two Democrats are leaving. Uh, so next time, they're not likely to be replaced by more conservative Democrats. We will have no overlap in the House. And for the second consecutive year, we have zero overlap in the Senate. The most conservative Democrat, uh, who is Mark Pryor, is to the left of the most liberal Republican, Susan Collins. So that's a very sharp difference. But I also want to say that polarization alone does not mean you can't have problem solving. I was thinking just a few weeks ago as I was writing a column about Henry Waxman and his decision to leave uh, Congress, that Henry is no centrist. Uh, Henry is a proud, tough, uncompromising, in some respects, liberal, except he compromised all over the place. And if you look at a 40-year career that included expansion of Medicaid to women and children, the Orphan Drug Act, the tobacco legislation, the Clean Air Act, and a whole host of other things, in every instance except his role in the Affordable Care Act, he had dozens, usually more than 100, Republican partners. 
Henry found ways, despite his strong ideology, because of a mindset that was, let's figure out how we can do this, sometimes in increments, you find the right moment, you'll find people, you do some give and take to make it work. And if you look at what Orrin Hatch did with Ted Kennedy, also not uh, particularly centrist individuals in terms of their overall ideological predilections, what John McCain did with Russ Feingold, and we could find many other examples, you can have individuals who are at the polls finding ways to work together. Uh, but it's different now. And it's different because we go beyond polarization. And there are two things that we need to keep in mind. One of which reflects more a, a kind of ruthless pragmatism. Uh, the other, uh, which is some, somewhat different, that I'll just reflect on for a couple of minutes. The first is the rise and now almost total takeover of what we call the permanent campaign. Now, when I first came to Washington 45 years ago, and indeed for at least the first 20 or 25 years, you had real seasons in the process. There was a season of campaigning, transition, and then a season of governing. And they were different. The campaign is a zero-sum game. There are winners, there are losers, there's nothing in between. You don't say, that was so close, you serve a year, then I'll serve a year. Or I'll tell you what, we'll each have half a vote. So the metaphors of war are used all the time, and not surprisingly, and you want to crush your opponent into the dust. You don't want to just wound him or her. You want to vanquish them. You don't want them coming back at all. You want to create a set of conditions where there's a scorched earth and nobody is going to rise up against you the next time either. And during those campaign seasons, of course, the prominent figures, the dominant figures, were the pollsters and the campaign consultants. But when the campaign was over, they would melt away. You wouldn't see them again for maybe 18 months. The pollsters would go off and they'd do polling for commercial clients. The consultants would go off and do PR or something else. And then you'd move into a season of governing. Now, the American political system, which is different from a parliamentary system, is an additive process. You need to build coalitions to make things happen if you want to govern. It's the way our system was devised and designed by our framers. They looked at this huge geographic expanse, 13 colonies made up of people who'd come from radically different places and different backgrounds and were living radically different lives from the most rural areas imaginable where people literally would not see other human beings for months to densely packed urban areas in places like Philadelphia and New York that make uh, today's Manhattan look like it would all be Central Park, how do you pull them together to get them to accept decisions that you would make in governing? You've got to build that broader coalition. It's not a zero-sum game. And so for most of that time, members of Congress would refer to people on the other side of the aisle as adversaries, not as the enemy. In fact, the old saw that I first heard uh, from um, a uh, uh, longtime representative uh, from Washington State uh, was the younger colleagues would come up to him and they'd point to Republicans. Uh, he was a Democrat and say, there's the enemy over there. He would say, no, no, those are your adversaries. The Senate, that's the enemy. Uh, that's how people would talk, but it reflected a particular mindset. And the nature of our system was such that the coalitions that you built were not what some formal theorist would aim for, the minimum winning coalitions. Human behavior is such that if you're trying to get to 218 or get to whatever you need in the Senate, you can't rely on minimum coalitions. But also, the nature of our policy process was such that you wanted and needed broad bipartisan leadership support to create the legitimacy that people would accept the policies made. And so we even had norms back in that time. The idea that a member of Congress would go into the district of one of his fellow representatives and campaign against him, it just wasn't done. Because that person won and came back, you'd poison those relationships. You would no longer be adversaries one day that would have to be or could be allies the next. We didn't do things that way. Well, as we moved into the 80s, and in particularly, uh, particular as we moved towards the 90s, I began to see very profound changes going on. Some of them were driven by technology. You could poll every minute of every day. Some of them by the nature of 
campaigning and advertising as we move from a small number of outlets to a much, much larger uh, number of places. You needed to cut through the cacophony uh, of uh, uh, communicators out there to get messages across. But for those reasons and others, uh, I began to see changes. I used to go to retreats that groups of members on both sides of the aisle would have. Uh, 25 or 30 members would go somewhere an hour or two away from Washington, sometimes a little further, for two or three days to talk about important issues. And I would get invited along often. And, you know, there'd be a table with 20, 25 people sitting around it. You'd have the members, you'd have the staff, and one or two outsiders. And gradually what happened was the staff got relegated to seats behind the tables, and their places were taken up by the pollsters and the consultants. They were not there six months and then fading away. They were there year round. They became much more prominent figures. The dialogue changed. You didn't talk about the big knotty problems facing the country. You talked at their insistence more about the wedge issues, the ones that you could use to drive a wedge between the other side's members and voters so that you could maximize your support. And all of that escalated after 1994 when Newt Gingrich took his tribe out of 40 years of wandering in the desert of the minority to the promised land, into the majority. And basically, what happened is, from 1994 on, we've ushered in an era where, in any given election, you can imagine the majority changing hands. Where before that, 40 years of democratic hegemony in the House there really wasn't an election where you could imagine that the majority would change. You'd have big changes in seats. But the Republicans basically in the House had a glass ceiling of 192 seats, 218 needed for the majority. They hit the 192 twice. They couldn't get above that. Newt changed that. And if we put together the fact that all of a sudden majorities were at stake and the stakes were so much higher, you weren't going from the possibility of a Speaker John McCormick to a Speaker Gerald Ford, which was like from here to here, or from a Tip O'Neill to a Bob Michael, maybe from here to here. You look at it now, and the difference between a Pelosi and a Boehner, I don't have arms nearly long enough to uh, look at those differences. And the same thing happened in the Senate. All of that combined with the need to raise money year-round now, not just for yourself, but for the other uh, members of your party, uh, and more broadly, has altered this basis. So we have a permanent campaign, and that means it's all thinking about elections all the time. And if you have a permanent campaign, if you think about building a broad coalition, and you work with people on the other side, well, you might give them more traction or more legitimacy or more popularity because of things that happen. Or you might take away some of that wedge that could work against them. And while that may only matter at the margins, at the margins is the difference between your controlling the gavels and the agenda and them controlling the gavels and the agenda. So working with people on the other side becomes like sleeping with the enemy. Now, nothing embodies the permanent campaign better than Mitch McConnell's famous statement in 2010 2009, he started with it, my number one goal is to make Barack Obama a one-term president. That's the permanent campaign. When Mitch said that, I thought, oh, I must have misheard it. He must have said, my number one goal is to get the economy moving, to get jobs, to improve education. And to accomplish that goal, we have to make Barack Obama a one-term president. He cut right to the chase. But it was actually, I think, underscored even more by something that McConnell said after the midterm elections. And he met with reporters, and he said, well, of course we weren't going to work with Obama and the Democrats. Because if we had, it would have given legitimacy to policies enacted. And if they were popular, that would have damaged our brand and improved theirs. That's the permanent campaign. And that's why you had, in fact, uh, a strategy, a very deliberate and almost explicit one, that began, we know at least, from the reporting done by uh, Robert Draper, who wrote a book on the uh, Tea Party freshmen, but actually went back a little bit, and it's now been confirmed by everybody who was there, that on inaugural eve, uh, in 2000, January 2009, 
where Democrats were having inaugural parties all over the city and celebrating after having won the White House and done extraordinarily well in gains in the House and Senate. Uh, a group of Republican leaders, including uh, Kevin McCarthy, Eric Cantor, Paul Ryan, former Speaker Gingrich, John Kyle, and many others, went to the caucus room, a restaurant in downtown Washington. They went in demoralized, disillusioned, depressed. And after their dinner, they came out more exhilarated because they decided that following the guidelines of the permanent campaign, they had an approach, and it was, we will unite in unison against everything significant that they want to do. And we will underscore those differences and find ways to delegitimize the policies. So when the stimulus package came up, we also know that Dave Obey, the chairman of the House Appropriations Committee, called in his counterpart, Republican uh, ranking member Jerry Lewis, and said, uh, Jerry, the economy's still flat on its back. We want to do a stimulus. Here's what I'd like you to do. I'd like you to go back to your leaders and your rank and file members. Come back and tell me the things you'd like to include in a stimulus, but also the non-starters, the things that simply wouldn't work for you. And Lewis laughed and pointed upward and said, uh, Dave, I'm sorry I have orders from on high. We are not going to cooperate. That is the permanent campaign, and we saw it play out on Dodd-Frank, on uh, the Affordable Care Act, and many other areas. But it's not just that. It's also uh, what I call tribalism. Polarization combined with tribalism is a toxic mix. And tribalism, some of which began also with the strategy that Newt employed leading up to 1994, 16 years in Congress of trying to figure out how you could break Democrats' stranglehold on the House of Representatives because it was every individual member of Congress having money advantages, name recognition, and the ability to separate themselves out from larger national political trends. They're all bad, but I'm trying to make it better, that sort of thing. How do you break out of that? Because the Democrats, by definition, had more incumbents with all those advantages. You need to both nationalize an election for Congress, but also get people so disgusted with what's going on that they'll say anything would be better than this. And that began a process which led to an increasing tribal reaction. And the tribalism increased even more because of the nature of modern media, where there now is an enormous advantage in economic terms to being tribal. Now, what do I mean by tribalism? Well, in effect, tribalism is where you say, if you're for it, I'm against it, even if I was for it yesterday, just because it's you. So what's the best example of that? To me, the best example is uh, in early 2009, we saw a commendable bipartisan effort in the Senate to try and deal with our long-term debt problem. Conservative Republican Judd Gregg of New Hampshire joined with moderate Democrat Kent Conrad of North Dakota, and they proposed a resolution that would create a congressionally mandated commission that would have the imprimatur of having been passed by Congress, signed by the President, where a simple majority of members could propose something sweeping to deal with the debt problem, and it would get expedited votes in both houses. And there almost literally was not a day in 2009 and into 2010, early 2010, when the aforementioned Mitch McConnell didn't take to the floor of the Senate or go on national television or radio or give a speech in which he would say, we can solve this problem, we can deal with this problem if only we had the Greg Conrad Commission. Sometimes he'd even call it the Conrad Greg Commission. If we could get that through, we could make this work, we could all work together if only President Obama would get behind the Greg Conrad Commission. And then in early 2010, Obama endorsed the Greg Conrad Commission. Shortly thereafter, it came up for a vote in the Senate. Got 53 votes in support was filibustered, fell seven votes short of passage. Seven original Republican co-sponsors of the Greg Conrad Commission and Mitch McConnell supported the filibuster and voted against it. Now, since early 2010, uh, I have, uh, for four years, I have been with my Diogenes-like lamp, gone around the country seeking another explanation for why those eight individuals voted 
against something that they had literally been for the previous day. Asking people, give me some other explanation. Nobody has been able to come up with one. This is tribalism uh, uh, personified. And it's gotten worse. Now, if you put the permanent campaign and tribalism together, that's when you get the kind of outcomes that we have. Because I thought, after the 2012 presidential elections, where Obama won a pretty convincing victory, that if Mitch McConnell now said, my number one goal is to make Barack Obama a two-term president, <laughs> mission accomplished, <laughs> can't be a three-term president, we've got a window here, maybe six months at least, where we could get a few things done. First thing that comes up, as you remember, was a gun bill in the aftermath of Newtown. Now, it was, a, again, a quite commendable bipartisan effort, indeed uh, even more uh, striking than Greg and Conrad. We had Pat Toomey, a very conservative Republican from Pennsylvania, joined with Joe Manchin, an NRA favorite from West Virginia, a Democrat, and they stripped the bill down to its uh, basic component, a background check. Over 90% of Americans favored a background check. Now step back and think about it. That means that even people who couldn't pass a background check supported a background check. And it got 55 votes. Died on a filibuster, falling five votes short. And Pat Toomey met with reporters from Pennsylvania afterwards and said, well, some of the members on my side of the aisle just weren't going to vote anything that he, the president, was for. So tribalism trumped the permanent campaign, even, in keeping a few things that should have been relatively non-controversial, that had overwhelming public support, from going through because it just wasn't going to work that way, even from the get-go. So all of that makes it difficult. Now, if you look at it and step back from it, in effect, when you put these things together, we have parties that, because they have grown so far apart, left the middle completely unoccupied, take such vehemently oppositional positions, they look suspiciously like parliamentary parties. That's how parliamentary parties work. But they don't work in a non-parliamentary system and a non-parliamentary culture. And what do I mean by that? Well, of course, our system has a very different setup. The parliamentary system, you elect a government. The government sets policy and gets those policies through. The minority reflexively opposes everything. They use every tool at their disposal, but they can't block the policies from going through. And the public accepts the legitimacy of the decisions, even if they hate them, because that's the way the system works. And they understand that in three, four, or five years, you're going to have a chance to ratify them or throw the bums out and bring in the other side. Well, we can't do that very easily because we have separate elections for a House and a Senate and a President. And so you don't always elect a government. But sometimes you do. And so for the first two years of the Obama administration, we had, in effect, a Democratic Party acting as a parliamentary majority now, they had an added twist here, which is the filibuster being used in ways that it had never been used before, raising the bar not to majority level, but to a supermajority level. But even with that, you had opportunities with a Democratic House and Senate with comfortable majorities and a Democratic president to pass a lot of policies. And we had the functional equivalent, in a way, of a parliament. And we had one of the most productive Congresses in the history of the United States on a par with, I would say, the famous 89th Great Society Congress of Lyndon Johnson that passed uh, a whole slew of things from Medicare to civil rights legislation uh, to uh, education uh, reform and uh, many others. And in this one, with the stimulus package, which was not just a, an amorphous stimulus, but with health IT, uh, with green energy, with vast expansion of broadband and a whole host of other things, was actually what the journalist Michael Grunwald in his book called the New New Deal, a lot of substantive policy. The Affordable Care Act, Dodd-Frank, uh, the Lilly Ledbetter Act, credit card reform, and a whole host of things. But unlike a parliamentary system, 
Our culture doesn't support it. Our political system was set up, as I said earlier, to have that broad bipartisan leadership support. And when you get everything passed with one party voting for it and the other in vehement opposition, we don't have a country where everybody accepts the legitimacy of the policies. We have half the country accepting it and half not. And you have a continuing campaign to further delegitimize and undermine those policies. So it doesn't work very well. But then, of course, we segue to the true nightmare of parliamentary parties in our political system, which is divided government. And as Dean's chart showed, we have moved to uh, both in the 112th Congress and the 113th, the least productive, at least in our lifetimes, if not further. Now, you look at the number of laws, and it's tiny. But of course, numbers are not the only thing. It's also a question of quality. Now, ironically, it was the 80th Congress that uh, created forever its identity uh, as the do-nothing Congress that Harry Truman ran successfully against uh, in 1948. And that Congress in 1947-48 will always be known as the do-nothing Congress, but it actually was a very productive Congress. Many of the things that had passed were over Truman's uh, opposition, and uh, uh, they were unpopular. But that Congress also gave us the Marshall Plan. Now, any Congress that passes one bill, and it's the Marshall Plan, is a historic Congress. But if your equivalent of the Marshall Plan is, in the 112th Congress, uh, the debacle over the debt limit that caused the first downgrade of credit in the United States in history, and your equivalent in the 113th so far is the shutdown, that's not quite telling you that there's quality that overcomes the small quantity of things done. And it's led us to what really is something very close to gridlock. Now with that, I want to talk for a couple of minutes about another element here, uh, in a building block in a sense, uh, and that is a second term president and the natural arc of presidential power and authority. There are reasons why we use the term second term blues. Second term presidents in the era of the 22nd Amendment that limits them to two uh, terms have lots of headaches. They lose momentum. After winning re-election, there's almost always a backlash, a reaction, call it buyer's remorse. Well, maybe we made a mistake. Maybe the other guy could have done better. There's always a problem and a big one with your own base. In effect, if you look at what happens to second term presidents, why do some win a second term? Why do some lose a second term? The single biggest predictor, the most powerful predictor, is do you have a challenge from within your own party for your renomination? If you do, you are likely doomed. So Gerald Ford, running for election, having been president for a while, has a devastating challenge from Ronald Reagan. That was it for him. Jimmy Carter, more devastating challenge from Ted Kennedy. George Herbert Walker Bush, devastating challenge from Pat Buchanan. You divide your own party. You have to spend money on a primary. You have to move towards the base and then try and move back towards the middle. You have a contentious convention. Now, if you escape all of that, you are very likely to win. But the problem is, to get there, you basically convince your base that they should cut you some slack because you've got to win re-election. And when you do, they say, now it's our turn. And they have a long laundry list of things to do, but they don't get them. And so Barack Obama is facing that kind of migraine headache from his base on a whole range of fronts. It goes back to discontent early on over the failure to close Guantanamo, uh, what we've done with detainees, now the NSA. It goes to foreign policy and a continuing unease uh, carryover from two unpopular wars and the fatigue that came from them. But the fact that if Obama had in, uh, been forced to go to a vote on the authorization to use force in Syria, so we had even the threat of force to try and make a change in the chemical weapons uh, equation. If that had come to a vote in the Senate, he wouldn't have gotten more than 40 votes in a Democratic Senate for that. Then you look at environmental issues. 
this enormous campaign on the Keystone Pipeline and enormous pressure now to use his executive authority in sweeping ways. A lot of pressure not to do anything about Social Security or Medicare, to make any changes or cuts there. Labor, which is growing very uneasy because it didn't get its wish list at all with a uh, card check or in any other areas, now focusing some of their interest on Medicare and Social Security, on the trade front and uh, across a number of other areas. At the same time, we know that midterm elections have a tendency overwhelmingly to work against the president's party. And usually it's really bad in the second midterm, we call it the six year itch. And so if you look at the Senate, the Democratic cushion is not enough. Now part of the reason is when a president comes in and does really well the first time, you often will get very good results in those midterm election, in those uh, presidential elections. But in the Senate, six years later, that means that a lot of your candidates who won in states that are going to be difficult are up again. So we've got at least a half dozen Democrats running in states that were Romney territory the last time around, and it's stiff headwinds. And if your approval rating is down, as often happens with second term presidents early in their terms, that makes it even harder. In the midterms, the out party gets angry. They've been out for six years. They want revenge. They turn out more. The in party, if a base is disillusioned, it makes it tougher. But what that also means, as our panelists suggested, is that your party members get more nervous as time passes and want a little distance from the president. Now, what they don't realize, or even if they do, they can't keep themselves from doing it, is the more you have divisions in the party, the more you want to separate yourself out from the president, the worse his prospects are going to be. It becomes a downward spiral. You're actually better off showing some level of unity, but it never works that way, and it creates a problem as well. And of course, what also happens usually with second term presidents is facing these difficulties, understanding that they've already got fewer members in Congress than when they started out, and fewer who want to go along with them, you see an increasing tendency to use executive power and also a tendency to turn more of your attention to the world where perhaps you have at least a little better capacity to move some of the chess pieces on the table than you do in Washington itself. And we're seeing this with Obama as well. Now I want to make a third point and then turn to what all of this means for policy that I alluded to but didn't emphasize. The polarization that we have and the phenomenon that we have is not symmetric. It is very much asymmetric. You could see this a little bit in some of the numbers that Dean put up, but it's true in a very substantial way. What we have seen is as the parties have moved further apart, if we use the familiar old football field analogy, the Democratic Party on the whole has moved from maybe its own 40 to 45 yard line out to perhaps its 25 or so as a center of gravity. The Republican Party has moved from its 40 yard line behind its own goalpost. There has been a dramatic move to the right. We see this in the public as we see it with the elite actors. If you look at the latest Gallup survey, self-identification, over 70% of Republicans identify as conservatives, overwhelming the numbers who identify as moderates or liberals. On the Democratic side, 43% identify as liberals. They are outnumbered by the moderates and conservatives in the party. And perhaps just as significant, if you ask all Americans, what do you think they should do in Washington? Compromise to get things done to solve the problems we all face, or stand firm on principle even if it means that nothing happens? Democrats and independents overwhelmingly say compromise. Republicans by sharp majorities say stand firm on principle even if it means that nothing happens. And if you look at the numbers, not just the National Journal numbers, but you look at numbers that have been devised going back to the first Congress to measure ideology by uh, political scientists uh, McCarty, Poole, and Rosenthal, you can see the difference between the parties, one party moving here, the other party moving there. And while we're now seeing a bit of a backlash at the pragmatic elite level with John Boehner 
uh, very publicly uh, chastising and even denouncing some of the forces within his own party. When you see a backlash to using the debt ceiling now as a, uh, a, a tool, uh, a weapon of mass obstruction, um, you can easily imagine that we're beginning to see a movement back towards something a bit more pragmatic. But keep in mind that the debt limit uh, uh, issue was framed much more in a different fashion. It was, we want to keep all of our focus on Obamacare. Look what happened when we got the distraction of the shutdown, and we don't want to distract anymore. And that had enough of an impact to enable a lot of members who, whose gut told them that they wanted to use the debt limit to let that one pass by. And when you look at the votes of putative presidential candidates on resolving the shutdown issue, and on the debt limit, where you have Paul Ryan voting against uh, the debt limit, despite the fact that he had worked out the compromise that added to the debt that was now being ratified, and you look at uh, Marco Rubio, Ted Cruz, uh, Rand Paul, and others all voting no. These are people who are looking at the temperature of the party, looking at where the presidential dynamic is likely to be, and deciding that the energy is still all over on uh, the more radical side uh, of the party. Now, as Dean suggested, and he's right, both parties have these headaches. And one of the uh, fears that I have is that the Democratic Party, which now has some added energy on the populist side, could itself move further and create an even greater gulf. But the big issue now that affects health policy in many other areas is what is in many ways an ongoing struggle that lasts, it's lasted at least 100 years in the Republican Party that goes back to when Teddy Roosevelt represented the more moderate forces against William Howard Taft and the conservatives. And he in fact left the party to form the Bull Moose Party and, of course, devastated his own party's chances for some time, uh, right around uh, 100 years ago. Uh, all the way up through another Taft, Robert Taft, ancestor of William Howard Taft, running against an establishment wing that included Wendell Wilkie and Tom Dewey and others in the 1940s and into the 1950s, then Barry Goldwater, then Ronald Reagan, but it's different now. There's a reason why Jeb Bush, not a Republican in name only, last year or a, a year and a half ago said Ronald Reagan couldn't win a nomination in the Republican Party now. Because while Reagan represented the insurgent conservative wing, he was a pragmatist when it came to problem solving and making policies. Now it's no longer a struggle between moderates and conservatives. It's a struggle between conservatives and radicals. And how that plays out over the next couple of years is going to have a lot to do with whether we find a time when we can actually move to some pragmatic adjustments in health policy or problem solving in a number of other areas and not have continuing crises that lead us in a different direction. Now with all of that, what we know is with the permanent campaign that the strategy of Republicans in the House which they ratified and settled at their retreat just a week or so ago is, let's not do much of anything. Let's keep the focus where we have. Let's hope that with the president's approval as low as it is, with the continuing struggles over the Affordable Care Act, we can capitalize on that, win uh, the Senate, gain seats or at least hold our majorities in the House, and then have more of an upper hand. Now, this was a strategy set even before that. Eric Cantor, the majority leader, laid out the schedule for 2014 a, a few weeks ago uh, and set a total of 97 days in schedule before the election. Very, very few days. And if you look at that 97, a very substantial portion of them are half days or less when they're actually going to be here. That's not a formula when you've got to continue to do the housekeeping things, like passing appropriations bills, uh, doing basic authorizations and the like, to do much of anything. But it included a memo that in effect said, everything is going to be on the table uh, with our chips on Obamacare. 
That's what it's all about. Uh, and now that's been ratified. So we may see a few other things done. And it may well be that the president, who now is being more aggressive in trying to use his bully pulpit to shape an agenda and real world things, may bring action on uh, extension of unemployment compensation, um, which has now been gone since the first of the year, um, and maybe on a minimum wage, possibly. There may be a couple of other things done. But right now, the intent is to do nothing or little. And what that means is that if there are adjustments along the way in the Affordable Care Act as it is implemented, they're going to have to be done on the fly by states or in some instances by the kind of executive action that we've already seen. It is a very different dynamic than we saw with the tumult and the rollout of Medicare Part D. Um, and that's likely to continue for some time. And what that also means, I think, is that we are going to see very different experiences state by state. Now, some of it, I think, is also going to include uh, a very interesting set of experiences in states where governors uh, have decided uh, not to expand Medicaid and where there are going to be a lot of interesting pressures, pressures that are coming from some of the health care providers that are now finding that they're on the line, and that includes uh, community hospitals, for example, where the boards uh, often consist of people who are strong supporters of Republicans in Congress and of those governors saying, what the hell are you doing to us here? Help us out. And all of a sudden you're hearing some talk about risk corridors for them uh, and supplements, uh, but not for others. But it's also going to bring some tumult in those states. We're going to see it even in states that have been highly supportive of the Affordable Care Act, obviously places like Oregon and Maryland where they've had rollouts that have been at least as bad, if not worse, than what we've seen uh, in, uh, uh, at the federal uh, level. Uh, but we're also likely to see more actions by the president to try and adjust this along the way. And those executive actions, which are not going to be nearly as sweeping as what we might see on the environmental front, um, are still likely, just as with the environmental area, where the Supreme Court has given the Environmental Protection Agency, this Supreme Court, uh, a few years back, uh, the authority to regulate carbon emissions. And that may come back to the courts. But we're going to see court challenges as well. So a lot of this is going to involve a tugging and hauling that will carry out through this year and into next. Now, I can't tell you whether Republicans are going to pick up the six seats necessary to take a majority in the Senate. Um, some of this depends not on the specifics of the rollout of the Affordable Care Act, but on more fundamental things. Uh, and that includes presidential approval. Um, now, some of that will depend on whether uh, this becomes, as many Republicans believe, an ongoing catastrophe that's going to end in a disaster and flames everywhere, uh, which I think is extremely unlikely. But it will also depend on the state of the economy and whether people are feeling better at all about the dynamic in Washington. If his approval gets up closer to 50 percent, it's stabilized, it's now a little bit higher than George Bush's was at uh, this time in his presidency, lower than some others. But if it's back up closer to 50, there's a pretty good chance Democrats hold on, if only by a thin edge, to the Senate. But whether they do or don't is not likely to change the dynamic for 2015 or 2016 either. Now, I do think it's heartening that we have now an alternative on the table. Rough as that alternative is, uh, the uh, Coburn uh, Burr et al. bill uh, is an alternative. And, you know, it, it makes me wonder where we would be if that had been a specific alternative put out there in 2009 where we might have been able to get some give and take and actually take some of the provisions of both of those plans and make a better bill that would have been bipartisan. But the permanent campaign was not going to allow that to happen. And we may see a House alternative, although what we're seeing is that as you get more specific, it becomes much tougher and, and much more difficult. If you're going to finance this by uh, putting a, a limit on the tax exclusion for health plans, that's a tax. And it's a big tax on a large number of middle class Americans. And that's why you've seen a scramble back from that. Uh, and it becomes harder. And finding an alternative that satisfies a base that wants to repeal the whole damn thing, that doesn't embrace substantial parts of it, 
becomes much more difficult. But if alternatives are on the table, you can at least imagine in 2015 some give and take where you can get adjustments that will smooth out this process to make it a little bit easier for people to get insurance, uh, to pay for it, and to have a system that will operate and work well. Uh, but I don't hold out high hopes. And I don't hold out high hopes that we will break the fever with the 2016 presidential election either. This is a process that basically fundamentally means, I believe, the Affordable Care Act and its fundamentals is here to stay. It's not going away. It's not going to collapse in flames. It's not going to be replaced by something fundamentally. It's not going to be altered, likely, except at the margins or through the use of executive power, which is a much more limited tool to use. You can postpone things here or there. I mean, you know, personally, I think it was a stupid idea to begin with to have an employer mandate. It's becoming increasingly clear that you can't make that work. They ought to just get rid of it and not keep postponing it. But that's uh, almost a side issue here. But it means that there's going to be an enormous burden on all of you to make this work as best you can, because it is going to be there, like it or not, and to try and smooth it out so that we don't get radically different experiences from one region to another or one state uh, to another, uh, which will be much harder to do. Uh, so as always, to end on a, an upbeat note, <laughs> book is selling very, very well. And so, and I'm very happy to take uh, questions or comments. Tell me who you are, if you would, also. Cheryl Smolik was here. Yeah, hi, Cheryl. Um, great as always. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, in history, is there any example that we can look to where you see this kind of polarization leading to tribal behavior, leading to the extremism and radicalism that we're now seeing in our in Congress, where there is a resolution? Is there? E what does it take? for that condition in Congress to change, or any yeah. political body to change and bring us back to something that maybe seems more sensible and logical and doesn't require that half the population die? Uh, well, first of all, I, I think it's important to note that uh, a, a polarization of sorts is more typical in American history than not. The kind of centrism that dominated for much of our lives, uh, and even a little bit before, is a little bit more unusual. And we had that, of course, because we had a very different regional setup. You had Democrats who had the strong southern base uh, that combined conservative base with the northern urban one, gave them majorities. You had a lot of moderate uh, Republicans. That was unusual. Uh, now, if you look at previous periods where we had the, regional, uh, the um, uh, polarization and tribalism, um, the best analogy is the uh, period right before the Civil War. You know, I wrote a, I wrote a column, uh, I wrote, a, uh, I should say, an article in, yeah, I wrote an article in Foreign Policy about the uh, 111th Congress, uh, and, uh, or 112th Congress, I should say, which uh, the editors titled, Worst Period Congress Period Ever Period. And that got a lot of attention, and a lot of people said to me, oh, come on, it's not the worst Congress ever. What about that time right before the Civil War? And I said, you're right. Doesn't it give you comfort to be compared? <laughs> and we don't want that resolution, uh, obviously. But we also had the period uh, in the 1890s, driven as this one was by economic turmoil, but where you had a party that went off the rails. It was the Democratic Party under William Jennings Bryan. <clears throat> you had it to some degree, in the Vietnam War was a driver with Democrats uh, going to the left in the 1970s and into the 1980s. There's a rule of three takes three presidential losses in a row to begin to move a party back towards a more of a problem-solving or at least a pragmatic mold. Um, and we had that, for example, with the Democrats losing to Reagan twice and then to Bush. You lose once and you can say, oh, we had a crappy candidate. 
You lose twice and you say, how could we be so dumb? Another crappy candidate. But by the third time, you're saying, maybe there's something more fundamental here than crappy candidates. Um, so that could make a difference. But this time, I'm afraid, the combination of a tribal media, you know, the fact is that if Rush Limbaugh, who has 25 million uh, or 15 million listeners and makes $50 million a year, if in tomorrow's broadcast, he started out by saying, you know, I've been thinking about it. Can't we all just get along? <laughs> I mean, I didn't vote for this guy, but let's all work together to make this a better country. Uh, then 14 and a half million people would shift the radio dial around and they'd go to Mark Levin or Laura Ingram or somebody telling them what they wanted to hear. So there's a powerful economic incentive to create greater division and to take on even people in your own party. At the same time, if you look in more detail at the campaign finance dynamic now, the people who are giving money to the Club for Growth and who are financing Heritage Action and a lot of these other organizations often very wealthy hedge fund people, some of whom you know, I am sure. These are not people who are going to say, geez, let's go back to the establishment. They despise the establishment of the Republican Party. They think they have cut and run, and their interest is in funding people who will rise up against and take over from them. They're not going away. So we're not, we're, it's going to be a while before we get out of this. Now, I do want to, I mean, there's also, it's not all bad. If you think about these parliamentary systems that I talked about in seemingly more positive terms, if you have a parliamentary system that can act and they keep doing stupid things, you get to where England is and where most of continental Europe is, which is in worse shape than we are, because they kept applying austerity over and over again, and they won't stop. And so they have higher levels of unemployment. They've dipped into a double and even triple dip recession. So we've actually pulled out of this a little bit better. We've somehow managed to get along. We still keep it within some boundaries. You look at what's happening in Venezuela, in uh, uh, the Ukraine, and other places. And our political system doesn't look all that bad compared to some others. It's true. But this is bad. And we are so far short of potential that um, it, it's, it's painful to tell you the truth. And I'm afraid it's going to be a while before you create a set of incentives to get problem solvers, which is what we need. It's not just the collapse of the middle. It's the collapse of the problem solving caucus. Who wants to run for office under these circumstances? Hard to find them. Well, you're ready for our next question. Um, I do want to point out, and I'd like the economists to start tracking this. Is So, so I grew up in Boulder, Colorado, <clears throat> Colorado being the healthiest state in the country with the highest highest average level of education as they reason through the problem. I just want to point out that they legalize mood enhancing drugs. <laughs> <laughs> and in fact, if you look at, you know, we have a 9% approval for Congress. And I asked myself at the time, who are these 9%? It turns out that they are mostly in areas where they have uh, legalized mood enhancing <laughs> Uh, Mike Johnson with Blue Shield of California. Uh, putting aside the question of how institutional reforms, political reforms could actually be enacted, are there any that you think um, could help to solve this problem? Um, you know, the second half of the book is devoted to what can we do about this, including, you know, uh, bromides to avoid. Um, but, uh, and I've got a whole laundry list of things, um, and I, I want to do them. It's a cultural problem, as much as anything else. The tribalism is cultural. Um, there's a racial element to it. How do you get away from that, especially when you have all of these interests that gain from additional polarization? So we have to do things that change the culture, and that's harder. But you have to start with structural changes. Now, I wish there were a magic wand and a panacea. And you know, usually the first question or second question that I get asked is, what about redistricting? Because, you know, gerrymandering has sort of hit the culture now, and they see it. Uh, and I want to have redistricting reform. And I think uh, when we look at states uh, that have done it, uh, like Iowa, Arizona, and now California, um, it, it's positive. But once again, go back to the numbers that Dean put up with the difference in population concentration in districts. And consider that Bill Bishop, who wrote a book called The Big Sort, it's basically right. 
People have moved into areas where they're surrounded by like-minded individuals. So if you do redistricting reform that fulfills the objectives, not these crazy-shaped gerrymandered districts, but that are compact, that fit within the standards of communities of interest uh, and you know boundaries of counties and cities and the like, we're probably going to end up with more homogeneous districts. And the problem, as much as anything, is we've got homogeneous echo chambers. Now, you look at those racial numbers, the, the divide, the number of Hispanics and African Americans, and on average, Republican districts have about 15%. But in the South, which is now the dominant driving force of the Republican Party, that number is much lower. You have a whole set of districts that are fundamentally lily white. And you have people there, you don't have different points of view. They get reinforced all the time. And redistricting, actually to make it better, to create more heterogeneity now, you may need to create more bizarrely shaped districts, not more compact ones. But there are other things. We need to enlarge the electorate, because the fact is that we still have a majority of Americans, even those who are at the polls, who want people to work together to solve problems, and they're not the ones necessarily voting. In these districts and in states, and here's again the problem with redistricting, it wasn't redistricting that cost Bob Bennett, one of the most conservative Republicans in the Senate, the ability to even run for re-election in Utah, or that got uh, 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 the uh, senator from Pennsylvania, Arlen Specter, to leave his party because he couldn't possibly win a renomination. The small fringe ideological groups dominate the primaries, so enlarge the electorate. I'd like to see the California system of open primaries extended, not necessarily a top two, maybe a top four with preference voting where you vote for your top choice, but then give your uh, preferences in order. If you do that, you're not going to end up with a situation like we have in one district in California, where you had an overwhelmingly Democratic district, and you had like 15 Democrats running and two Republicans, and the Democrats split all their votes, and the two Republicans got bare pluralities, and so the only choice voters had in the fall was a Republican. But also, if you have preference voting, you're likely to avoid a situation where a more extreme candidate with a plurality can win. Um, so there are ways of doing this that don't get to a, a more sweeping measure, which would really be my preference, which is the Australian system of mandatory attendance at the polls, where you have to pay a small fine if you don't go out. You can vote for none of the above. Um, but we're not going to do that. We don't like mandates. Now, my alternative to a mandate is let's have a lottery. Uh, you know, <laughs> Mega Millions Lottery, um, your vote stub uh, your, is your uh, lottery ticket. And uh, I've actually, I've got a piece appearing in the Post this Sunday on using the District of Columbia as a laboratory for a whole set of changes. And what I propose there is let's get some beneficial, say, car dealer to put up a Cadillac or a Mercedes. And what we'll do is we'll choose five names at random off the voter registration lists and then after the election, we'll go in order uh, to see which one can provide proof of voting. And all you need is one sap who loses a Mercedes because he didn't vote. The next time, you're going to get a big increase in, uh, in voting. All right. All right, so ladies and gentlemen, um, we're just about at break. Next year, um, hopefully, when Norm comes back, he's going to take up the issue of uh, what age uh, should we teach school children uh, the how to spell gerrymandering and the meaning of the word. <laughs> so please work on that. Um, but in the meantime, um, let's let's thank Norm, who's who proves that you can deliver substance um, and important information without using PowerPoint slides. Everybody. <laughs>